Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank the conference organizers and the organizers of this session for the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about the CDC activities. I'm going to focus, I'm not, can't be comprehensive in this short period of time. I'm going to focus on some CDC activities um, in Thailand, so specifically in Thailand. So just to, to provide a little uh, overview of what I'd like to cover, um, I'd like to start with some background. Uh, why should we focus on adolescents and youth for HIV prevention? Some background information I think is important for all of the presentations that will happen today. Um, and you know, as a reminder, although adolescents are maybe a smaller proportion of population at risk for HIV, it certainly can have, um, prevention can have a big bang um, for adolescents for impact. Um, given, you know, the translation of a long lifetime morbidity due to HIV and um, acceleration of HIV transmission over a long period of time. So youth are a very important focus. I'd also like to talk about policies and structural changes that might support prevention for um, adolescents and youth. Um, and also, um, in specifically some of the research and implementation uh, sciences activities that are being addressed by CDC with partners here in Thailand. Um, I also just want to end with how do we connect with youth and adolescents. Um, and I think that would be a very, very simple, simple um, conclusion. So just to start with some background, which I think if you are in the arena of adolescent health and HIV prevention, many of you are aware of this um, really important uh, publications. But I wanted to highlight one um, supplement that was very, very helpful. It's a Journal of International AIDS Society supplement on HIV and adolescents focus on young key populations. Um, and I think this actually had a compendium of, of different types of um, summaries of data that if you go to one place, this is the place to go. So there's an estimated 39% of new HIV infections are occurring in adolescents annually. And despite global declines in HIV, um, HIV-related deaths among young people is, has increased by 50%. And it's estimated that 95% of new infections among adolescents in Asia are among key populations, and 70% of all who inject drugs who are, are under age 25 years. And a number of high, uh, challenges were highlighted in these publications that I think many of us know in the arena of adolescent um, HIV prevention, including co cognitive, contextual, and structural factors that increase vulnerability and challenges to adherence and prevention strategies. I also wanted to highlight some of our own CELOM Community Clinic data that really points to the young as a place to focus here in Thailand. The Bangkok MSM cohort study, which was a study that, um, long-term study looking at HIV incidence, um, demonstrated in almost eight infections per 100 person a year um, in the youngest age group, 18 to 21 years. And in that cohort, we didn't look under age 18, so we really couldn't report out on what was happening in the younger group. Um, and I think that has been a, a major question for a number of groups here in Thailand to really um, try to hone in on what kind of data is available for uh, those under 18 groups. Um, and so in a, another particular publication from this compendium um, just highlighted some important things that I will bring up as well as that adolescents are often not included in a number of biomedical and combination prevention tr treatment or prevention trials. And so um, they're, they're left out for a number of reasons. They're, they're harder to work with, as we all know. And also, there's often issues of parental permission or pr parental consent, which makes it even more difficult to study these um, interventions in adolescents and young people. But I think many are coming to appreciate you really do need to look at this unique population for prevention modalities. There's some really unique considerations. So I think that is a, of interest to me, in particular looking for new novel strategies to prevent HIV in the youngest groups. Um, and then there's urgent needs for research on factors impacting adherence to and retention in care and prevention. This is the major challenge for, for adolescent prevention. 
I know that there's going to be a talk on PrEP, so I'm not going to go through the data from the Adolescent Trial Network, which is uh, in the US and focused on uh, PrEP for youth at risk. But just some a few take-home points from that were that PrEP could be implemented in youth but really required specialized considerations. There was very poor study visit retention. No surprise for those of us who work with this population. Um, PrEP adherence varied by race, ethnicity, and dropped significantly at the later visits. The lowest adherence was in African Americans. Um, there was very high HIV STI incidence, and PrEP was well tolerated, really um, good safety record from this, from this study. So I wanted to actually um, step back and think about policies and, and, and structural changes that could support um, youth in prevention. And I think this is really, really important and often missed in w when we think about all these uh, different projects or research that we can do in adolescence. But certainly, Thailand has really led the way in thinking and in, in being uh, forward thinking in these um, policies and, and, and for HIV prevention in youth. Um, the Thai Medical Council provided guidance in January 2015 that parental permission would not be required for HIV testing. And I think that's been very, very important to sort of open the door for youth for HIV testing for access and, um, and is just one example of uh, forward thinking policy. PrEP guidelines in 2017 have um, been allowing or uh, PrEP uh, providers to support uh, adolescence and PrEP provision um, with a focus on those at substantial risk and, and the guidance of close monitoring on adherence and side effects. And then starting in 2020, as many of us know, PrEP under the NHSO, you know, a um, demonstration with 2,000 individuals will, it is occurring. Um, but I just wanted to, if I was going to translate a little bit of this, I think policies in general in the region that can support access while in enabling a appropriate oversight for a vulnerable population like adolescents are really needed for HIV prevention. And those could be you know, access to PrEP, low or no cost, um, support and access to treatment, um, and adherence support. So I'm going to, um, I'm fortunate to be representing our CDC activities, and I want to thank Dr. Rangsima and Dr. Sarika, who provided a lot of help with some of these slides and really leading on both the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention activities and the D Division of Global HIV and TB Prevention. Um, we have two programs here at CDC, one a focus on research and one a focus on program activities, and, and both our groups are coordinating on, on activities. Just to highlight a few things, our Salem Community Clinic has been, had the opportunity to look at adolescents who are coming in for HIV testing over a period of time, and I'll share some of that information. And we conducted a YMSM, or Young MSM Cohort Study, um, and qualitative study, and we have some interesting information from that study, too. And from um, CDC DGHT, there is the YM to M Outreach and Service Delivery Activity that I'll highlight uh, on behalf of Ring Summit and the team, and a prep demonstration where I'll provide a few slides an overview and um, to defer to the team for other um, questions. So for Salem Community Clinic, um, we've been providing care um, and, and HIV testing since 2005. So you can see here on the um, figure from 2005 to 2018, the number that are less than 18 that have been served. Um, it's not a, the largest proportion of our uh, clinic uh, attendees, but it's a, it a very important population. and. Um, clearly, the HIV prevalence and incidence um, that we've been finding is very high. So overall, when we look at those in our Salem Community Clinic that have come back for a visit so that we can actually look at a cohort, an open cohort, um, our overall HIV incidence rate has been 7.8 or almost 8 per 100 person year. And that's in uh, those under age 18 years. Our YMSM study was looking at both qualitative and quantitative um, uh, around prevention in adolescents and youth. Um, our qualitative activity occurred here in Bangkok and was primarily focused on under 18. And the quantitative uh, was 15 to 29 year olds, but I will focus some of our data um, specifically in 15 to 21 year olds. 
In this study, we screened for HIV infection, and those that were not infected were enrolled and could be enrolled into the study in three Thailand sites, um, what, two here in Bangkok and one in the Kansawan. And they were followed every three months um, and tested for HIV and STIs through uh, NAT testing. And then for CELAM, we were able to uh, do PrEP provision, so we could do a demonstration project of PrEP provision. So I wanted to share a little bit of, about our qualitative study findings. Um, there was a really interesting focus group and key informant uh, interview findings, but I just wanted to highlight some of the risk behaviors we noted, and no surprise for those of the, us working in this field, a number of online apps is where people meet uh, sex partners, and sex activities can begin um, early. Um, sex activities can in, in involve drug use and um, group sex, and there's a fair amount report of inconsistent condom use. We did um, ask some questions around uh, parental permission or consent, and I think this is a really interesting area because um, uh, there's mixed feelings and thoughts about uh, parental consent. On one hand, there's interest in not blocking youth access. On the other hand, there's interest in um, having a, a, an approach that involves the family. Um, so there were a number of, of points made by adolescents about parental permission um, for prevention or involvement in a research study. Um, some quotations that are interesting, if parental permission is re required, some youth will not be able to access prevention or treatment, which is pretty insightful, I would say, and um, pretty accurate, too. Um, and then one person who said, requiring parental permission is detrimental to the research you might actually say prevention, too, as it limits opportunities for youth to be included. In our YMSM cohort study, um, we were able to also appreciate the HIV incidence over time. And, and um, we found a much higher HIV incidence rate in this study of 15.8 per 100 person year. Um, there was only 44% uh, or 44% never returned for any follow-up visit, and that varied across different sites. At CELOM, we were able to have very good retention. In other sites, there were less retention. And so exploring why that is is very important for future work. This is hard to see, I'm sorry, but let me just highlight a few things. Um, that we were looking at things like depression and also looking at things like uh, forced sex. And so um, we don't have previous data from our Bangkok MSM cohort study on this, so this is a new question, but I think it's really, really important. And also, um, concern or what level of risk they thought they had for HIV and STI is also, I think, an, an insightful question. It was very interesting to see overall that um, about 58% 50, um, thought that they had no risk for HIV, and 50% overall had thought that they had no risk for STIs, despite the very high HIV and STI prevalence we were seeing. Um, I was glad to see that a number of the participants thought, uh, reported that they had at least one family member or a friend who knew and accepted their identity. Um, a large proportion, 28% um, overall, felt sad or depressed in the past month. And um, very uh, a limited report outs on forced sex in the last three months. With that, I'm gonna kind of move on to our, um, the next project I'm gonna briefly summarize, which um, is the YM2M study and, uh, activity. It was increasing HIV testing and strengthening HIV prevention, treatment, and care services among young MSM. Um, the objectives of this activity were to increase access to HIV and STI testing and prevention and education among young MSM and TG women using a virtual online clinic platform with um, various outreach strategies. And it was also to establish a network of young MSM and transgender um, recruited into different clinic settings. And I think many clinic settings around Bangkok participated in this. And um, I think it, it was uh, very widespread in, in the community. It was very collaborative, this activity. Um, I think we're highlighting here the number of partners that were involved. Um, including CDC, but many of the partners on the ground doing the work. And there was a number of components, including free online counseling, I think um, in many ways novel, available for um, adolescents, youth, um, as in a convenient hour for them. 
Um, they had a referral network of a number of different clinics throughout Bangkok. Um, and there was uh, outreach in various situ uh, uh, both schools and hotspots for this activity. This is a, a shows the, the website, um, the chat love care station website for this activity. And it was very dynamic um, and evolved through the activity. Um, just the, the flow of the activity, um, the MSMTG adolescents registered on that uh, site that you saw earlier, and they had an online counselor, and um, they had, were advised on uh, potential risks for HIV and STI. And then they were advised to go to a clinic, and then there was a tracking activity for those who um, attended the clinic. Um, and this was an opportunity for them to both re receive PrEP if they were negative or be connected to care if they were HIV positive. There were a, a lot of novel outreach and uh, activities, including hotspots, schools, and uh, dance dances, local Thai dances. And there was um, really interesting findings. The yield was especially um, high in the online and hotspot outreach with overall prevalence around 10% for both of those settings. Um, on, an, on another note, um, to, to move on to our, the same day prep demonstration project for adolescents at Sirarat, this was uh, an evaluation of same day prep and um, the outreach shows the myriad of different um, youth that were reached from about 80% males, uh, almost uh, more than 50% MSM, but a variety of different risk populations. And the findings for this, again, uh, replicated the very high HIV uh, and STI prevalence with um, an overall uh, positivity of 14% for chlamydia and 5% for gonorrhea. And there were some barrier barriers expressed in this activity, including um, too many pills, a big bottle, forgetting to take pills, and concerns with side effects, as well as stigma. I think through these activities, a number of these CDC activities, I think it's been clear that there's interest, um, strong interest of the youth to have youth-friendly clinics, outreach, and settings for prevention. Um, and some of the characteristics that have been described here um, help, I think, frame what we think about for the future for um, care and uh, for adolescents. So a setting where there's no stigma, it's accessible, easy, one-stop shop, integrated services that might include reproductive health, mental health, um, minimal charge but even better free, and, and really match with the teen lifestyles um, with you know outreach through online platforms. Um, I won't go into this because I know there's a, a presentation on PrEP um, just to highlight some of the potential future considerations for PrEP in adolescents. So I think through many of these activities that CDC was working with partners here uh, in Bangkok is um, there's a number of new HIV and STI infections among youth, particularly young MSM. And I think there's a room for more education on HIV prevention. Um, there's a lot of interest in varied prevention choices and combination prevention, integrated preventions, and ways that we can increase intervent, uh, the uptake and the retention of youth is really needed. Um, and youth-friendly services, although, um, you know, I think is what the kids are looking for. If I were to sort of think about um, distilling some of what I think are really important future activities with a focus on youth prevention, again, I think it's, there is a really a, a great need for adherence support um, in youth-friendly ways um, and new tools and approaches. I don't want to dismiss the value of having perhaps a long-acting prevention approach that might be able to uh, be used in an easier way than daily prep or daily um, treatment. Um, but policy and structural changes are really, really key. Um, limiting the barriers to testing, limit, um, allowing treatment um, uh, with or without parental consent, uh, prevention, low cost, easy access, 
enhancing the autonomy for healthcare decision making, and tailored prevention for youth. Um, you know, I think it, it is important also to still within that context to have the oversight and support of youth um, as a vulnerable population, but there's ways that I think we can support more access and more freedoms for uh, prevention choices. Um, and there's one area that I think there's little research in youth is supporting persistence or long-term engagement. That's not just adherence for the here and now, but over the long haul of years of prevention. And I think many have not started thinking about the big picture of the long-term prevention. So the final question is a simple one, and I'm not going to answer it, um, but I'm just going to show you a picture. That how do we better connect with youth for prevention? I think is, you know, our tool is right in front of us, and I think that's really key for, for a number of the activities that we do ahead is um, the way to engage youth is where their eyes are, which is on cell phones and applications and other activities. So um, there's a lot of really interesting novel approaches, um, and I think more and more of those, especially those that would work in the Thai context or the regional context, I think are needed. I want to thank a number of people that have been doing these activities um, on behalf of both uh, DHAP and DGHT, um, just a really a large group of people and our partners as well in all this activity um, from uh, academic, government, uh, CBO, non-government. Um, this work is only possible with uh, strong collaboration, so I want to thank our partners. And that's it. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Elaine. <laughs> any comments or questions to Elaine? Should I start? Sure. Connect with youth. How to? Are we too old to connect with them? <laughs> Well, I mean, I have a 12-year-old who's just entering into adolescence, and I'm convinced that um, that things are moving so quickly, but, but using similar tools. I use my phone, and he uses the phone, um, relating, relating in ways that we relate. And we're always going to relate to youth and adolescents in some way. But I think, you know, we're all using these tools, but for adolescents, these tools are front and center. And so I think... I think there's a lot we can do in that arena. Um, I think that a lot of the thinking should occur through young people um, and engaging in peer-to-peer -peer and other kinds of activities is really critical because I think the relatedness of peers is, is and the respect and the approach might be different. So I'm a big believer in not only using the tools like the applications and cell phones, but also peer-to-peer -peer approaches. Thank you. So a lot of work for us, you know, to connect with them. Yeah. Any more comments? I have a yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask about research and getting data, especially for adolescents who are under 18. So you mentioned briefly that there are a lot of barriers with getting data, and it's a vicious circle where without the data, we can't have programs that support adolescents under 18. And that's the problem that I think a lot of us face in this region as well. Do you have any comments or ideas about how we can overcome this barrier in getting to the data? Yeah, I, I think, um, yes, it's a, it's a significant barrier. And I think even like the HIV Prevention Trials Network has recognized that this is a really important area to focus on. And there's much interest in at the same time, time as there's tools developed for adults, those tools are brought into clinical trial early for adolescents. Instead of it being, well, it works in adults, so of course it'll work in kids, there's a, the idea of a more of a parallel approach in conducting clinical trials um, at the same time so those approaches are available to youth soon and early because we need those approaches. Um, I also feel like, well, there's a, a role we can play in, in um, recognizing the importance of that science um, in our regions and our countries because I think um, sometimes the big challenge or barrier is regulatory reviews. And I think that um, 
in, uh, helping educate our regulatory authorities on the, the value and importance of that and the oversight for safety um, can, I hope, pave the way for more of that work. I hope that answers your question. So thank you, Eileen. Thanks. Give a big hand to her.